one. So here we go. Three, two. Good afternoon. This is Molly Jones, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee for the Baltimore County Board of Education. This afternoon, the preliminary design of the Summit Park Elementary School will, will be presented before the committee. And for this, I call upon Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit to begin. Thank you. So thank you, Ms. Jones. Um, my name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management. Uh, as part of the capital program, board had approved replacement for Summit Park Elementary School. Today we are here to share preliminary design. The design is an advanced prototype, advanced improvement on the prototype used for Dundalk Elementary School and Chadwick Elementary School that we had already presented to you in the past. Our team has worked closely uh, with the school administration uh, and curriculum instruction team. I'd like to acknowledge and uh, and thank uh, community superintendent, Ms. Christina Byers, uh, Dr. Sharanda Gregory, and Dr. Basil McCombs for all the help that you have given us. We have also worked with Summit Park community. It is an active community that has been intensely involved uh, in just about every phase of the design, and uh, we were happy to do that. Uh, our team held several meetings with them. So with that, and I'll introduce my internal team, uh, Mike Archbold, I don't know if he's here, um, and our Director of Construction Improvement, Mr. Merrill Plate, and our Project Manager, Pamela Strickland. If you want to turn your camera on, it's okay to do that so that everybody can see who you are. If not, that's fine. And with that, uh, I would give it to Ms. Uh, Melissa Wilfong from Grimm and Parker, who's the uh, head of the A&E company that has been doing this design for us. Melissa. Thank you, Pete. Um, just to confirm, everyone can hear me OK and see the full screen of the presentation. I can. OK, very good. OK, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, this is my first remote Board of Ed meeting, so hopefully um, this goes off without a hitch. OK, quick agenda. We're going to start with some project information and then move on into some more of the details of the current proposed design. So the existing site is in the northeast portion of Baltimore County, inside the Beltway and outside of the Baltimore City line. The current Summit Park Elementary School is approximately 47,777 square feet, and this is a proposed replacement. And like Pete had mentioned, this is an evolution of a previously used prototype. The existing state rated capacity of the school is 336, and the enrollment as of 2019, when the last real accurate enrollment numbers were available, was 470. The proposed state rated capacity of the new project is 674. The acre, the site is 20 acres, um, but 6.25 acres of that site is dedicated to program open space. So it's a little bit um, tighter than it first appears. There are two regional programs currently on site. One is the Falls program, which are three classrooms and contained in the program. And the other is an ECLS pre-kindergarten room. Moving on to some of the project goals and supporting um, uh, perspectives of what the project design. So first, like all of the educational specifications for Baltimore County Schools, this project is focused on integrating flexible learning opportunities throughout the throughout the project. So there's several spaces that are organized to be flexible and to have multiple arrangements in order to address every possible learning style. There's also hands on learning spaces and collaborative spaces throughout the building. We also continue our progression in sustainable design. This is this school is being designed to meet LEED Silver certification and LEED version four, which is the latest version. There are several features that continue to be developed in this prototype that help us to exceed those um, energy standards and one is the ground source heat pump system. 
The, also, the project uses LED lighting throughout. We have a high performance building envelope and we're using recycled materials and low flow fixtures. We've also incorporated several opportunities throughout the building in interior and exterior to integrate environmental learning into the building itself. Promoting school safety includes both on the site and inside the building. So you'll see in the site plan that we show in a few moments that the, the circulation is separated into cars, uh, buses, and pedestrians, and that all three of those patterns are overseen by the administrative suite on the front of the building. Inside the building, the building is also zoned to include public and private spaces that allow the building to be controlled for, for after hours use. In terms of school security enhancements, we have uh, multiple cameras throughout the interior and exterior of the building. The building is controlled by a card entry system and the entry to the building is controlled by a two-step uh, vestibule electronic access system. So you enter into the vestibule through a set of doors that has to be, but you have to be buzzed into and then from that vestibule into the lobby area, you're also again buzzed into that. So showing some of the surrounding areas, this is the Baltimore City Line and the location of Summit Park. Within that two mile perimeter are several elementary schools. These are the schools that are in the most adjacent zones to Summit Park. The middle school, Pikesville being uh, the most direct feeder and the high schools in that same zone to, of Summit Park. Okay, zooming in on the site a little bit, the school itself is located along Diana Road and it's just south of Green Summit Road. The property appears to connect to Green Summit Road, but it does not connect um, directly. Some of the buildings currently on site are the original uh, school built in 1965. In 1995, there was a modular building added as well as a building to serve the Park and Rec preschool program. Due to the overcrowding, there are currently 10 portables located on the site behind the existing school. Some of the features of the site include a lot of existing specimen trees, some of which we're saving, including a, a registered Y oak that's in front of the building. Um, the parking and circulation is really difficult. The parking is, um, is short of what's required and the circulation patterns uh, provide some backup along Diana Road for drop off and pickup. This is the existing site plan. You can see entry points along Diana Road for bus and car circulation. A service drive is to the north of the existing building that's also used for overflow parking. The buses pull in through the bus loop and drop off at the front door. The portables you can see behind the building. And this area is the designated program open space area and there's currently ball fields on that open space. This is the park and rec building. A visitor parking and visitor and staff parking as well as the car drop off lane through this parking lot. There are two playgrounds currently on site and a tennis courts. So switching over to our proposed site plan, the existing building location is shown here. You can see how the, the build the site is very compact between the existing building and the line that designates the program open space. If we remove the existing building, um, this shows the eventual build out. The main entry faces Diana Road. Bus entry, we're using the same curb cuts currently being used by the bus entry. The buses enter and then circulate around and to the front of the building and drop off along the curb at the front walk and then back out to Diana Road. Car entry, we're using the current bus exit as the car entry, providing a significant amount of stacking space on site for cars to come in, drop off at the opposite side of that main front walk entry, circulate around the visitor and staff parking, and then back out to Diana Road with a right turn only. The service areas to the south of the building. Now to talk about some of the pedestrian circulation 
We're going to zoom back out to the current site plan. Um, and this shows the location of current crosswalks and we're maintaining that pattern as much as possible in the new school design. So there's one crossing guard that exists at the crosswalk on Green Summit Road. There's a crosswalk across Diana to the north of the bus loop and then currently two crosswalks that cross the entry and exit drives along Diana Road. So the students will come from Green Summit. If they're on the north side, they'll cross the crosswalk. They come down the east side of Diana Road and then cross the crosswalk again to come on the north side of the bus loop and onto site. They're coming from the south. Again, they cross at the crosswalk north of the bus entrance and onto the site. There are two pedestrian pathways that we will maintain for the new building. One is a paved pathway that comes from the south to the front of the building. And the second one is a worn pathway that kind of comes from Green Summit Road. I want to reiterate that the property you can see in this diagram doesn't actually connect to Green Summit Road. So moving forward to our site plan again, using similar paths of pedestrian movement, we have two ADA accessible pathways onto the site, one from the north and one from the south. Students will come down Diana Road or up Diana Road, cross in that same crosswalk, and then access the site from either the south of the uh, car exit or the north of the bus loop, being able to get onto the site with minimum amount of crossing of any of the traffic. It's greatly increasing the safety of pedestrian traffic on site. We'll maintain that paved pathway to the south. And then if students do continue to walk along the worn pathway, we'll direct those students onto the site and around to the front of the building through the development of some of the paved areas to the north of the school. There's two playgrounds on site a paved play area. The play fields will remain in their current location on the program open space. Like Pete had mentioned, this is an evolution of a prototype used many times over multiple years, starting with Mays Chapel, which opened in 2014. You can see the similarity in the diagram of these schools, but the ways in which they've been designed specifically to suit their sites and program. The unique feature of Summit Park is the shortness of the current plan and that that was has been designed to fit into the site available without interrupting the operation of the current school. Getting into the building, the entry in this diagram faces to the bottom of the page, the community park and rec entrance to the left of that. Like I said before, the building is separated into a private academic zone and a public zone. So doors are provided at these points to lock down the building for after hours use. Circulating into the building, you enter into the lobby and then into the reception area where you're checked in and then allowed to enter into the building. There's two main points of circulation intersections in the building. One is this lower hallway circulation which enters both the first floor of the first classroom wing and an access to the guidance and health suite and community use areas. Um, this main circulation allows access to the gymnasium, the learning commons, the dining room, and then down to the second main intersection, which access the second classroom wing and the music classrooms to the left. If you go out the back of the building, you're in the play fields and grass beyond. So highlighting the main spaces, administration and guidance shown in the red up front surrounding the health suite and the community room to the very end of the, that bar. The gymnasium connected to the cafeteria and the stage. Restrooms are provided for student use and are conveniently located for after hours use also. The music classrooms to the back of the stage for direct entrance and the learning commons central to the plan. The digital learning space uh, located in the first classroom bar, uh, regional special education program classrooms, pre-kindergarten classrooms, and first grade classrooms all located in this first front classroom bar. There's specialty classrooms, maker space, and art room, as well as first grade classrooms and the rear classroom bar. 
Every classroom is <clears throat> has direct access to an extended learning area. Moving upstairs, the front classroom bar house, houses third grade and second grade classrooms. Each of these have their own dedicated collaborative use areas and they each have access to an extended learning area directly from their classrooms. The rear bar houses fourth grade and fifth grade classrooms, their own collaborative learning areas, and also their own extended learning areas. Specialty classrooms are designed to be flexible and spaced throughout the second floor. This is an exterior rendering of the front of the building. This is the courtyard showing the two uh, playgrounds, and you can see some of the features designed to support outdoor learning. And now we'll run the animation. So we're moving right into the front of the building. You see the bus drop off to the right, car drop off to the left. To the right is the two story classroom bar. To the left is the administrative suite with glass that looks out over both circulation areas. This is the entrance to the community use space directly off, off the drop off for easy access. Around the back is the service area. Parking spaces for the building support staff. Facing the field to the rear are the music classrooms and the second two story classroom bar. You can see the end of that main circulation spine glass filled letting sunlight into that main circulation hall. Around the courtyard side, each classroom bar ends in a stair tower. Looking into the courtyard again, you can see some of the a, uh, outdoor learning opportunities available in the courtyard and outside the courtyard. And back around to the front of the building and the two story classroom bar at the front. Okay, now we're gonna go into the building. So going into the front doors, you'll be buzzed in here. The door will open and allow you to access the vestibule. There's glass so you can be seen while you're in the vestibule, and then you'll be allowed access into the reception area. Once checked in, um, you'll be allowed into the main circu circulation pathway of the building. To the right, you can see there's a touchdown space for parents and visitors. There's a kiosk for information and a screen also to provide information to visitors to the building. And to the first left is the gymnasium. You can see there's abundant daylight into the gymnasium. This view shows the operable, operable wall open to access the dining room. In the cafeteria to the left is the service area and to the right is the main corridor. We move out of the dining room into the main corridor. The learning commons is directly across the street. Entering into the learning commons, there are two teaching spaces in the learning commons, one to the right designed for the older kids and one to the left that's designed for the younger kids and the furniture is selected appropriately. You can see the glass looks out onto the courtyard beyond and there's a door so that students inside the learning commons can access those environmental learning opportunities outside in the courtyard. Back out into the main corridor, the main stairway is located directly off the main corridor as well as three additional fire stairs in the building. At the top of the corridor, accessing the, uh, the first classroom wing and this shows the collaborative, an example of one of the collaborative areas in the second floor classroom wings. There's a variety of different kinds of adjustable furniture provided in each of these collaborate, collaborative areas, as well as plenty of whiteboard and pinup space. Now we're gonna circulate back to the main corridor on the second floor. So we're at the top of the stairs again. And this corridor uh, connects the two second floor classroom wings. We've raised the ceiling in this uh, main space to allow as much sunlight deep into the building as possible. And going down the second second floor corridor, you see that the color is different. The colors used for wayfinding and to identify which team that you belong to. 
Here we're going to go inside of a typical classroom, showing some of the flexible and mobile furniture provided in the classroom. The rooms are designed to be organized in a variety of different ways to promote different learning styles. To the left, you can see into the extended learning area, abundant glass to ensure safety, security within that space. And then back out onto the main corridor. In the extended learning areas, we've maximized the high glass that allows sunlight to filter in from the adjacent spaces. You can see that here above the door and the boards. And then the final collaborative area on the second floor. At the end of the corridor, we've set the stair off to allow for future additions and to also allow for sunlight to come into those upper floor corridors. Then we end on a view out um, to the playground just outside the courtyard. We just have a couple, couple stills left of the interior. Um, this is the cafeteria looking toward the stage, so with our back to the gymnasium. Again, this is the gymnasium with the operable wall shown open in this instance. The learning commons, you can see again the view out to the courtyard. One of the collaborative learning space with some examples of the flexible and adjustable furniture. And finally, the typical classroom. So right now we're scheduling up completion of design in the next month or so, and the termination of the, the, the remaining schedule are, are yet to be decided. So thank you all. Um, and Pete, I am I'm finished. Um, so sorry. thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, please let us know. We'll try to provide responses to them. Uh, if we don't have it, we'll get back to you. Uh, this is since the board has already approved the capital plan. No design approvals are required. Um, this is just for your information and review. With that, Ms. Jones. I have a quick question. Is this is this um, considered a, I guess, park school or the, the recreation center will be using this space as well? Yes, as part of our program, we work closely with recreation and parks. And in all of our school, uh, there are recreation and park uh, that we, since county funds our school, uh, this is our partnership with uh, recreation and park. So during Great. this, during the ad spec development stage, we work with recreation and parks people to make sure that school also meets their requirement. Thank Mr. you. Pete, Mr. Pete, this is Rob McMillian. I have a question. Sure. Ms. Wilfong, do you have a still photograph of the outdoor uh, hard surface court area? I saw the playgrounds, but I didn't see the hard surface court. Uh, I think that would probably be best shown in the site plan. Now, but. I'm just curious, and it, it's trivial to anybody that didn't. You, you know, I grew up on a basketball court. When I, I've seen a couple basketball courts where the baskets are not lined up so that you can play full court basketball. They're like to an angle. Now, I don't know why they were designed like that, but it seems you know, people who want to play basketball want to play full court basketball and not half court basketball. And and I just I don't know. I, I know it's trivial. Thank you. I just um, thank you. I don't see any basketball courts on there, so I guess they're not. The details not been provided. So we work with recreation and park and with our athletic program people in Lara Elementary School. What we call we have half courts to meet the needs of elementary school kids. You will see basketball court in middle school and high school, but in elementary schools, uh, most of them, some of them may have full courts, but most of them have half courts. Um, Pam or Merrill, do you want to add anything to that response? 
But Mr. P Pete, uh, that's what I want to. OK, the elementary schools, but there's still people other, after the school hours are done. There's people that play on those courts or, or could play on those courts. I grew up on the court at Essex Elementary School and it had a, it was a full court and we played full court whenever we had 10 people with those side courts. You can't do that. And it's it, you know, it's it, you, it's like playing on a half of a soccer field or a half of a baseball field. That's all I want to say. I'm sorry to bother you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much and, and thank you for all of you who have helped us in the design. And uh, Ms. Uh, Melissa Wilfong, thank you very much for your presentation. Ms. Jones, can you hear me? Ms. Jones? We can hear me, you, Ms. Pester. This is Ms. N. I, I lost connection momentarily, but if I uh, need to continue to share, please let me know. Deep. So I was waiting for uh, Ms. Pasture's question. So Ms. Pasture, do you have any question? Yeah, I, I'm, can you hear me? I can hear you. OK, I just um, want to thank you, uh, Mr. Dixit and your team. Um, this really was um, a monumental task. I appreciate the work that you did with the various people in the community. I couldn't really see the presentation because I'm on the phone and so I was looking at diagrams, but I'll get to see it. Um, but I know you've worked hard. I've been riding out there in the areas so I could see um, all of the things that community people and you have been saying. So I just want to thank you for and your team for the work that you've been doing. So we appreciate your remarks for the benefit of the rest of the group. The community has been very active in participating in how the design progresses and uh, Ms. Pasture and Ms. Byers have been very helpful uh, in uh, in making sure that we are communicating and sharing uh, as the design progresses. So thank you very much for your remark and for all the work you did with our team. No, thank you. Okay. So with that, Ms. Jose is back to you. Our design presentation is completed. I'm not hearing anything, so maybe Ms. Oh, Jones. I'm muted, sorry. Do, do board members have any more questions? I see Ms. Hens here. Ms. Hen, Mr. McMillian. No more questions for me, thank you. All right, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, just a real quick question for you, Mr. Dixon. Is this prototype any different than our uh, new schools that are being built, the Colgate or uh, New Northeast Elementary or Honeycomb, is that similar prototype? So we have two or three different prototypes uh, depending on the program and the size of site. Uh, our internal design team ma makes a decision as to which prototype will meet our needs best. So all of them are not same. They are different and by three different companies. So Colgate perhaps was a different prototype. This one is the one with Dundalk Elementary School and Chadwick Elementary School. So uh, even though it is prototype designs are, it takes a lot of effort and full design work is needed as you know, if the sites are different and if the programs are different. So did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And so what makes you decide the prototype based on 
because I see they're slightly different. Is there a deciding factor that makes you pick a certain prototype for an elementary school? There are two or three different factors, main factors. One is obviously the size of the school, the type of program, and the most important is the site. So the shape of site um, determines which prototype may be the best. And even within one prototype, what you saw here is how it has been uh, modified to meet the requirements of the site. So it's the same building, but it is totally modified for each site. OK, thank you. And actually, if um, and I have a question just out of curiosity for slide 17, where you have the two doors going into the vestibule. Um, it was just something that popped into my mind why the second set of doors was, was not after the exit to the main building in the office, because it seems like once you enter the office, you could essentially just enter the building because there's the second set of doors would not stop you. Um, but so Melissa, you want to handle that question? I think you can answer it better. And you guys probably know the answer. There's probably a reason, perfectly reasonable answer for that. I just, I was curious. Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll let the expert answer that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'm sorry I didn't mention it, but that second set of doors is locked. So during, dur when students are coming in the morning or going out in the afternoon, they can move through both set of doors. But once the building is occupied, those doors are locked. So you can't get through that second set of doors. OK, that, go ahead. Does that make sense? Yeah, so my question still is though somebody enters the office, they could still then just get into the building without. I was thinking more of like in the banks when you enter, and you have the second set of doors where you could be squished in it. And if you don't want to give that person access, they're just trapped between those two doors. Oh, you mean once you get into the reception area? Correct. Yes. Well, if you have gotten into the reception area, you're then screened um, before you can move forward, but uh, there's not another uh, uh, locked door from there. So there's two sets of locked doors. So presumably uh, you've already stated who you are and your purpose for being at the school before you get into the reception area. OK, and if you actually were to pull up the slide, what I was trying to say is that really if you were to say a random person was to enter and say I'm X, Y, Z and you you let them in, there really is no way for you to then contain that person from entering the building if they were a bad element. Yeah. And I, I just thought the way the banks do it where you could kind of trap them between those two sets if you didn't want them to enter the building. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. You guys probably know a lot more about this than I do. It was just something that popped into my head. I hear it. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. If board members have no other questions, I think we can um, say thank you to Miss Will Fong. I hope I pronounced your name right, and Mr. Dixit. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, you know. Mr. Corns, do I just start the building and contracts meeting or? Yeah, yes, ma'am, that would be fine. Thank you. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the building and contracts committee for Monday, October 11, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being present physically that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting 
that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by, by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Slade, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Jose? Present. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Present. Mr. Kuhn? Present. And Mr. Offerman? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Ms. Anderson. Dr. Mar Dr. Mary Boswell McComas. Present. Dr. Monique Wheatley Phillip. Present. Dr. Michael Zarchin. Present. Ms. Christina Byers. Dr. George Roberts. Ms. Barbara Burnop. Present. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes. Present. Mr. Corn. Present. Mr. Dixit. Present. Dr. Parandozzi. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Mr. Plate. Present. Ms. Somerville. Ms. Somerville. Present. Thank you. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slade. And welcome everybody, good evening. Um, I want to take a quick, quick minute to say today's Indigenous Peoples Day and I want to make sure that we honor the first people of Americas. Um, with that, I'm going to hand this over to Mr. Saris. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is George Saris, Executive Director of Fiscal Services. The first item uh, that we have on the agenda is JME 505-22 speech, occupational, and physical therapy services, services for the Office of Birth to Five uh, Infants and Toddlers Program. This is a new competitively bid contract for speech, occupational, and physical therapy services for children ages birth to five, for the Office of Birth to Five Services Infants and Toddler Program. Approval is requested for a five year term with five recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $2 million. Committee members, are there any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Saris, please proceed with the next contract. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, MWE 804-22, contact tracing services. This is a new expedited contract for COVID contact tracing services for the Office of Health Services. Approval is requested for a nine month contract with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $145,000. Mr. Is I have a question. Please go ahead. Ms. Ken. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Saris. Good afternoon. Um, do you know if the expanded purchasing authority is to um, address an expanded scope for these services, or is it to provide additional resources to deliver on the current scope? I believe this is to meet our current um, our current needs, uh, which 
as school is open uh, additional weeks at a time, that job becomes more complex and the contact tracing efforts uh, along with them. Uh, we have uh, methods in place to pay stipends to nurses. Uh, we've hired additional uh, staff to perform this function. We have some existing contractors and we find that we're not keeping up with the current demands that we're experiencing. And so we wanted to add two more options for health services to try and meet our uh, very urgent needs. No, this, that's great. And I apologize. I was looking one contract ahead. Um, so I apologize. I was asking about the, the HR and financial management system software services. Oh, so no I, I'm jumping ahead of us. I apologize. Okay. Um, and, and yes, I'm very pleased that we are adding help for um, our nurses with contact tracing. So if Mr. I have a question on the next, the same question for the next contract when we get to it. So for Mr. Right. Sarah. Are there any other questions, committee members? Hearing none, Mr. Sarah, please proceed with the next contract. Thank you. The next item, LKO 400-20. Human Resource and Financial Management System Enterprise Software. This is a contract modification to provide for the continued use of the Human Resource and Financial Management and System Enterprise Software. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority, excuse me, by $535,000, bringing total uh, revised total contract spending authority to 13110000 with with uh, one awarded vendor approved by the board uh, in August 2019. And these are, uh, this is not an expanded uh, scope of our ERP system. Uh, this is uh, essentially uh, to provide additional consulting hours uh, over what is approximately the next year uh, to do two things. Uh, first of which is to continue with our recovery uh, and the second of which, which is part of the recovery, is to uh, use uh, consulting resources with the vendor to uh, rebuild and replace the very uh, many uh, reporting features and capabilities uh, that we had prior to the cyber attack. And so those two, uh, those 2,500 and 500 hours mm -hmm. respectfully would be consulting support from the ERP vendor. Okay, Ms. Joes, may I continue with my questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. Saris. Um, are these the same pool of consultants that would be used to implement the 12 month pay option? Uh, we have a separate contract for that uh, service and I would it would be up to the vendor to identify uh, the resources they wish to assign to these uh three different projects sure and I, I know that the constraint that we had discussed previously with accomplishing that for particular project the 12-month pay option was that there's a finite number of consultants with the expertise to be able to help us with it so my, the question i had was if we are expanding the number of hours um, on this contract does that have we found additional expertise and to to be able to support that project or are these hours being spent on ransomware recovery and I think you answered that question for me um, as opposed to um, expanding the scope have we found that we need additional hours to recover from the ransomware attack or could some of that time be spent to implement the 12-month pay option so uh, separately we have I believe a 1100 hour contract for the 12 month pay option. Uh, 
Okay. And um, I don't, I haven't discussed with the vendor their depth of resources, but I know that our own staff resources are primarily consumed with the recovery. And then um, after we present a contract next month, hopefully to replace our timekeeping system, that that project will also uh, be competing for our own staffing resources to support that separate project. So. Uh, and I know our staff, how, how thin we're spread. So I, yeah. I certainly don't mean to minimize that by any stretch. Um, my last question, and, and I appreciate your, your help with this, is can you speak to the need for these additional hours and services as it relates to the ransomware recovery? Um, what we're well, as of um, now. I can generally speak to it, and, uh, and Ms. Murnott may have more details, but we have uh, a list of uh, tasks that we're working through. Those tasks um, include uh, repairing and recreating lots of interfaces, um, as well as uh, restoring processes that are now different uh, because the processes that used to run on our servers that we controlled are now running in the cloud and, and need to be uh, scheduled uh, coordinated in coordination with both us and the vendor. Uh, I mentioned the reporting capabilities as well needing to be reconfigured. Um, and let's see, I'm sure there's something I'm leaving out. But uh, oh yeah, uh, even just uh, so a complexity of report writing is that uh, you have to be able to navigate the database and when the database was on our servers, it was a lot more accessible now than it is in the cloud. So lots of the benefit of being in the cloud and the safety does uh, require us to restructure our approaches, our processing, our reporting, and, and that is taking up our resources. And so based on the list of tasks, uh, this is, I would say, our best estimate of where we are working through those outstanding tasks. Thank you. And, and we certainly want to be whole again as soon as possible. We want to ease the burden on you all. We, we know how hard you've worked and for so long and want to provide you the resources you need and to make our staff whole because they they have been more than patient with this process as you have been and everybody's put forth such tremendous effort. Um, I, if this gets us there, great. If, if you have the sense that we will need more, whatever it takes. Um, I'm just trying to get an understanding of what this gets us in terms of allows us to meet the deadlines that we're, we're trying to aim for to make us whole, if it's additional resources or what, you know, 500,000 gets mm -hmm. us in terms of closer to being whole for our people. Well, Thank we appreciate that. Uh, it's, you know, there's over 21,000 people affected by this, both, you know, members of the public, the, the employees um, and the staff who are working primarily on this campus and in information technology to keep things moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Saras. Um, are there any other questions, committee members? If there are not, Ms. Mr. Jones, Sarah. this is Mr. Kuhn. Please go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Mr. Saras, um, this is now the fourth modification of this specific contract from, from what you're what you've shared, um, the last one being in in January. Uh, you know, we've had two since 
the ransomware attack. Um, and this is the third one since the ransomware attack from what I can gather. And and my question to you, I mean, this is, this is a, a basic project management question. Um, do we have everything included to get to finish the job here? Or are you going to be coming back for another modification at some point in time? Because it's it's very difficult to track what's actually happening. Um, you just you know keep coming back asking for a significant uh, expansion each time. So I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, let me see if I can help. So uh, the initial contract we brought forward um, in 2019 when county government uh, decided that they were moving to a different system uh, which i believe is workday and so because the school system had always uh, cooperated with county government on that platform we uh, we needed to move uh, to bring you an independent contract and with the cyber attack we brought you a contract uh, an interim contract for one year of cloud services as well as some consulting support to respond to the cyber attack uh, reconfigure our systems in the cloud and be, and continue operations uh, we brought you a modification as we talked about for the um, uh, 12 month pay project. And we are bringing this uh, amendment to, uh, to the board uh, based on our best estimate at this point, which is another year of support uh, following this coming up on, I guess in December, we'll be coming up on the first full year following the cyber attack. And uh, we will need to bring you another contract uh, next month um, because this the, the second contract that we brought you to move into the cloud was just a one year uh, service agreement and so the vendor uh, is working with us to provide us a longer term uh, cloud-based agreement for services so uh, that is something that we would bring forward uh, next month thank you i appreciate that um but i'm looking at the entire contract spending authority and it says 13 million dollars right and it looks like you've only you've barely spent any money on this contract well it's a five-year agreement and we spend um uh, i understand i guess my, my point being you know at this point there's 13 million dollars hanging out there and you've 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 maybe spent just you know less than 20 percent of it from what i can tell that's that's why i'm questioning the need for the additional amount now i actually appreciate the fact that you come to us every time you're realizing you know maybe maybe it becomes a bullet to say you know we need to achieve we've, we've realized we need to do x y and z and that's what these three thousand hours are for uh at this point in time um i don't i'm not gonna i'm not gonna I'm not going to disagree or or vote against this. I'm just pointing out the fact that we have a tremendous spending authority on this already. Um, so it looks like we need to start start spending some more money. To be honest with you, uh, I'm not quite sure where your burn rate is uh, from when I'm looking at this, but it looks like you have money for five years based on what I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I can understand your question. So. Um, one of the uh, reporting capabilities that we're trying to resuscitate, in fact, this week, is um, to update that spending report uh, 
capability. So uh, let me uh, see if I have anything that I can bring forward tomorrow. Uh, and if not, we'll provide it as soon as it's available. OK, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm just trying to point out that there's yeah. just a lot of money there, and I'm sure you're going to get questions from other board members yeah, uh, about it. And, and we agree. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. Um, if there are no other questions, please proceed with the next contract. Thank you. Uh, the next item, MWE 811-20, is the uh, 2019 PEPM Technology product line. Uh, PEPM is the Pennsylvania Educational Purchasing Program for microcomputers for which we have uh, cooperated to purchase a lot of our uh, hardware and software needs. We are requesting to modify the contract uh, and extend it by one year and increase spending authority by $8.5 million with the uh, 12 uh, uh, with the 15 awarded uh, vendors that uh, participate in this contract and we've listed uh, in the description of the exhibit uh, the the large uh, allocations of the spending authority uh, the sources of funding and the purposes for which uh, they will be used and all of which uh, are existing services and we'll be happy to answer specific questions. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. Sarris. Um, yes, I do have one quick question. You said it's a spending authority increase of $8.5 million out of which that includes the $1.1 million coming out of the SR and CARES Act. Is that correct? So, um, actually not. This, uh, this in, well, uh, the emergency connectivity fund is part of the, uh, I believe, the American Recovery Plan, uh, but it uh, it's separate from the the ESSER grants that the school systems have been awarded. So uh, approximately 2.8 million for extending our hotspot services uh, would come from that grant along with um, uh, 350,000 in uh, operating funds and um, 300, uh, Fifty thousand dollars for um, from Title One. So that's the biggest new expansion of uh, purchases that that we're eligible for under these uh, under these two grants. Um, the the non-public piece, as you mentioned, the one point one million. That's part of our original ESSER, ESSER 1 CARES grant, about 2.7 million of which went to private schools. Uh, I think approximately 52 private schools in Baltimore County that we are responsible for uh, distributing and measuring those, those expenditures. So that portion, is what we have anticipated they will spend on their share of that grant um, with our uh, management and control under our management and control. So yes, those are um, part of that ESSER grant. All right, thank you, Mrs. Saris. Ms. Hen, you had a question? I did, I had a few. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, Mr. Saris, what are the current expenditures um, is this a, a retroactive approval based on current no. expenditures? No, we have renewing uh, licenses for the Promethean class flow software, the Lightspeed internet content filtering software, Safari montage software. Um, those are the three 
uh, items that have been historically in place um, that we'll continue to purchase. Um, and we really don't have any longer a formal audio visual budget. Uh, I believe it may be as little as $600,000 and Mr. Corns can correct me, but what we do try and do is uh, at the end of the year, if we have additional funds available, you know, we have 7,000 classrooms all in uh, various state of audiovisual capabilities, uh, probably including the wax pencil method. And um, schools also use their own budgets to purchase uh, to replace Promethean boards um, as well as our capital construction projects uh, where those are installed in renovated and replacement schools. So that um, two point uh, two and a quarter million relates to those three different uh, funding sources, but all uh, with the uh, single purpose of audiovisual capabilities. And and that's great to see. And and I'm my hope is that we're able to bring all of our schools up to um, modern standards with AV and with Promethean boards and to have the modern technology that our students deserve. Um, I'm specifically interested in the hotspots for virtual learning and what our um, goal is in terms of replacement cycle for those since we did purchase them um, when the pandemic closed schools and that's nearly half of this um, purchasing authority. So is that something you could speak to or Mr. Corns if he's I think Mr. You know? Corns would be best because those um, plans are a little like cell phone plans where you buy so much data for so many months and I think he could best explain that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sarris. That, that's exactly right. And uh, Ms. Hen, there was two. There were two parts of our hotspot initiative um, during the pandemic. Uh, one, one of which was procurement of the physical device, um, mm -hmm. and the other one was the pooled data that was uh, shared amongst all of the hotspots that were distributed. So, as we continue continue with students in virtual learning and other. Uh, um, avenues where students uh, without uh, internet um, can gain access to it through this initiative. Uh, we're finding that our bandwidth usage is high enough that we're we're needing to procure more bundling of bandwidth through um, the vendor that we're using. OK, so this three and a half million then is just for data. Yep. Wow. It's and it's a lot. It's a lot of data and a lot of hotspots. At one point, I think we were close to 4,000 pieces of equipment. Is that still in the ballpark? It, yes, Mr. Okay. Sarah, 4,000 plus. Okay. Okay. Most of which we're, we've secured through this grant, so. Or all of which it looks like. Yeah, so Ms. Hen, the, fir the, first, uh, the first installation of uh, the data was through uh, the uh, ESSER and CARES Act money that kind of wrap around. And then this is through um, the um, Emergency Conductivity Fund, which is a branch of E-rate that has been opened up by the federal government uh, that we've applied for um, a few uh, initiative pieces. But uh, the prominent one that we've asked for through that um, avenue has been more data for our hotspot initiative. OK, now will any of the um, state's rural broadband initiatives help with with plans and in, in increasing family access? I know that there's expansion of access. Um, that 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 have, build out Ms. Hen isn't going as quickly as um, our, our students would need it, but yes, eventually, you're absolutely right. It would it would start to be able to let us sunset some of this mm -hmm. um, as the uh, rural buildouts uh, continue, um, as well as the partnership that we forged with uh, the county government, uh, where they recently spent, uh, I believe, it was about 2.2 million dollars to bring 900 more homes online in the northern part of the county, mm -hmm. and so um, it's a concerted effort across. Um, 
multiple agencies. Uh, we're working with uh, county government, for example, through the um, the ability to do um, the Comcast Essentials um, uh, procurement for uh, families that uh, are experiencing economic disadvantage in areas where Comcast is available. So this is just one of the prongs that we have in order to bring some relief to, to students that need home access. OK, thank you very much. And my next question you may also be able to answer, um, Mr. Corns, is regarding light speed and, and that licensing. Um, which of Lightspeed's products are we currently using? We're Any using, addition to filtering? Oh no, we're we're using we're using their uh, their filtering a um, relay agent. Okay, so we are not using monitoring. Uh, not through Lightspeed. Not through Lightspeed, and our contract exhibit indicates that the student data privacy agreement is not applicable. Um, is Lightspeed storing? student search data or do they have access to that? Um, not not through the way that we've got it set up. It's uh, kind of like Microsoft would be where we have our own tenant. Mm -hmm. So none of the um, the vendors um, whose services we're procuring using this contract have access to student data that would be germane to the, the to requiring the student data privacy agreement. Is that correct? Uh, Safari Montage currently has a signed copy already. OK, so that would be um, relevant. Could this exhibit then be updated? Mr. Sears, I guess that's a question for you. Um, certainly, I just need to. Review the agreements and we can report uh, back tomorrow to the board. Oh, All right, thank you, Mr. Sears. My, oh, Mr. My, my last question on that vein is, um, Mr. Corns, I was looking for the um, information on student data privacy that we had on the previous website. Do you know where that's housed or if there are plans to bring that back online in terms of what student data um, are shared with each of our vendors? Um, there was a great resource for parents that was on the former website, and I, I couldn't locate that on the new website. Ms. Hen, you've asked that question in email. This is not relevant to the contract here. Uh, Mr. Sarah, Mr. Corns, if you could respond to Ms. Hen's question via email. She sent this question earlier this morning. It's directly um, related to Safari Montage as well as Lightspeed, which are procured under this contract. Mrs. Corns, could you answer this with a, with a minute? Um, or you could. Sure, I, I will uh, certainly I will certainly follow up with the uh, office responsible for that. And um, if it's not currently present, we can make sure that it is uh, uh, reposted to the website. I, I'm, Ms. Hen, it could very well be that it's in a different spot, but um, with the rebuilding of our website, I'll just make sure that it's uh, it's where it needs to be. Yeah, there was a fantastic site that that you were in charge of when we got our TLE certification um, through COSIN that had all of the the information um, that would complement this this contract exhibit in terms of what student data are shared um, with what vendors and in what tools. So I was looking for that information in researching this contract. And that would be very helpful um, if it's elsewhere. I just couldn't find it. Mr. Corns, please provide that information uh, via email. Thank you, Mrs. Saris. Please proceed with the next contract, please. I'm sorry, Ms. Jones. I have one one simple question and won't take long. Go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Um, Mr. Saris, I. Are we purchasing, because it says other purchases include Promethean, Promethean audio visual equipment and video, et cetera. Are, are we purchasing um, microphones and speakers for teachers to use in classrooms um, at all to help uh, children hear? I, I know it's difficult with masks uh, sometimes for, um, for teachers to, to be heard. Well, I don't think so. I know that we purchased uh, vast numbers of headphones last year for the hybrid instruction model, and I don't believe we've done, uh, we've revived that amplification feature in the classroom. Uh, Mr. Corns, do you have any knowledge of that? 
Uh, Mr. Sarris, uh, I believe that in uh, some of our new school constructions, we've put in uh, audio enhancement within the classroom, but I uh, I have not procured any or been asked to procure any through uh, um, uh, okay. local teachers. I, I just thought that it might have fit here. That's that's the only reason. And um, Ms. Jones, I have no further questions for any of these contracts. I've already reviewed them this, this morning, so um, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. On to you all ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sayers. Thank you. Uh, the next item, uh, 6 ARA 203-19, cable and wiring materials and services inside and outside plant. This is a contract modification to uh, extend this contract for one year, uh, one, excuse me, one six month uh, one year, six months with eight, the eight of vendors are vendors approved by the board in October 2018 in alignment with uh, the state of Maryland contract, which has exercised its option to extend their original contract on which we're cooperating. Thank you, Mr. Sarah's committee members. Any questions? Hearing none, Mr. Sears, please proceed to the next contract. Uh, the next one uh, delves into the world of sewage treatment, which Mr. Dixit may Mr. wish to, to take care of. address. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the next contract is JME 507-21. It's for the operation of a wastewater treatment facility at uh, Hereford High School. This is the only facility of its kind. So the contract is to provide operation of wastewater treatment plan. Any questions? Committee members, any questions? <laughs> um, I have a quick question, Mr. Dixit. This is the annual operating fee for that treatment plan for Hereford High. No, this is actually the operation of the plant itself. So what it provides is 24 seven sensing of what's going on. It's a remote of uh, re remote monitoring of the facility, including input and output flow rates, conditions of process, water activity, bacteriological process, and several visits during the week to look at it, to make sure it's operating in compliance with all local and state codes and regulations. And have we at any point at BCPS looked into the cost of actually connecting this to public sewer system? There is no public sewer system in that part of the county. It is up in Hereford, so. Yes. Okay. And because of the quantity, regulations required that it have its own plant. So there are four or five other schools that have that are in septic tank. This one, because of the quantity, uh, it requires its own wastewater treatment facility. And what do you do with the summers when the school is closed to keep it operational? So it, it is since it's being remotely monitored. So if there's any issue, they have the ability to sense it. So during the summertime, there's less inflow and outflow because there's no occupancy, but the plant is still operational. Okay. All right, committee members, any questions? Uh, hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract if it's yours. The next contract is MWE-803-22, and this is for restoration of fire-related damage at Delaney High School. Uh, the contract will provide services to make sure that all of the items that were damaged during the fire, they are replaced, and the work is done so that uh, we can occupy the facility without any smoke damage without any smell, odor, and uh, it's it's uh, acceptable for students. The cause of the fire was a stage lighting coming in touch with the screen with the 
stage curtains. Committee members, any questions? Um, I think Mr. Offerman had a question and he may ask that tomorrow, but um, in case he doesn't, I think his question was if we had insurance that covered the fire at Delaney. That's a good question, really, because we have insurance, so most of this expense will be covered uh, except for the deductible. And Mr. Saris can share the deductible uh, amount, I, I believe it's $5,000. Yes, Mr. Dix, it's correct. And we may actually have a little more than 150,000. We'll share with the board if it's uh, above and beyond the approval limit. Any other question? Sorry about that. I think I froze. Um, thank you. Are there any questions, committee members? Hearing none, Mr. Dixit, please proceed with the next contract. So the next contract is GDA-303-22. It is for transporting modular classrooms and associated services. As you know, uh, that a lot of schools have relocatable uh, classrooms and we adjust those numbers based on the enrollment projection on an annual basis. So sometimes we lease it, sometimes we buy them, and sometimes we move one relocatable to other school if, if a school doesn't need that relocatable. So this contract is for transporting those modular classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Committee members, any more questions? Hearing none. So the final contract for you tonight is MBU-506-18, and that's for a sprinkler system maintenance, repair, installation, parts, and inspection. And we are requesting an added amount of $250,000 on a million dollar contract for five year period. Our expenditure has gone up and we are requesting the additional amount to meet the needs of the fifth year of the contract. Committee members, any questions? Hearing none. Um, I will now entertain. Thank you, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris Thanks. for presenting the contracts. And if there are no questions, I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items one through nine be moved to the full board for approval. So the question is on the recommended approval of contracts one through nine for board action. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. Ms. Slate, please take the roll. Ms. Joseph, who made the motion and who oh, is? Sorry. Yes, is there a motion? So moved, Kuhn. Second, Hen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Hen. Uh, Ms. Slate, please proceed with the roll call, please. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. And I do not believe Mr. Offerman has joined us. Is that correct? Correct, he's not here. And Ms. Jose? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slade. Uh, there being four in the affirmative, the motion passes contract one through nine will be moved forward to the full board. Is there any further business? Uh, because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night.